I get really excited when people discover an experience. I get really proud when it clicks, when people walk in and they discover this is what graduate is. This, this is what they have set out to accomplish. Welcome to the second season of The Modern Hotelier, the fastest growing hospitality podcast. Both hosts were named top 100 most powerful people in hospitality and voted fourth most popular podcast by the International Hospitality Institute. Each episode will get to know an industry expert and we'll discuss the latest trends in hospitality to help you, the modern hotelier. Welcome to the modern hotelier. I'm your host, David Malilli. I'm your co-host, Steve Karen, And I'm the producer, John Boomhofer. Welcome to today's episode. We're thrilled to introduce you to Stay Flexi, an innovative platform revolutionizing the hospitality industry. Backed by Y Combinator, Stay Flexi is a modern, all-in-one PMS platform. Leveraging the power of AI, it's transforming how hotels operate, maximizing efficiency, and boosting sales for unsold rooms. Already, over 2,000 properties worldwide have made the switch to Stay Flexi, experiencing the difference it makes. And here's the best part. Exclusively for our listeners, Stay Flexi is offering an incredible lifetime deal at just $149 per month. That's an astounding 80% discount. Don't miss this opportunity to elevate your hotel's performance with Stay Flexi. Stay tuned for more details. Who do we have on the program today? Yeah, David, today we have on Kevin Osterhaus, president at Graduate Hotels. Before coming to Graduate, Kevin worked at some of the most exciting hotel groups like Bunkhouse, the Standard Hotels, 60 Hotels, and then Ennis Moore. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you. Great to be here. This is, this is great. Thanks, Kevin. So we're going to go through three formats. We're going to get to know you a little bit better, talk about your career, get into industry topics. Sound good? Sounds perfect. Okay, here we go. What was the worst job you ever had? One of my first jobs was a summer working for a veterinarian. And all I remember is is, is spaying and neutering animals this this summer as as a kid. That was my very first job. Are you a morning or a night person? Right now, I'm very much a morning person. So if you had to delete all the apps on your phone and you could only keep three, what three apps would you keep? I would keep the Delta Airlines app. (laughs) I would would keep the... um, I hate to say this, the Instagram app, and I would, um, right now, I would keep solitaire. So what is your most used emoji? My most used emoji is the um, the explosion. It's the boom emoji. It's, you know, I, I, for some reason, I think it adds emphasis to anything when you hit the boom emoji, Set, c- followed closely by the mind blown emoji. Got it. So if you're not grilling, what's your go-to restaurant? If I'm not grilling, my go-to restaurant is a restaurant here in East Nashville called Wild Cow. I am definitely not vegan, but it, it's, a, it's a vegan restaurant that I, that I love. What's your favorite vacation spot? Italy. Full stop. So if you had your own talk show, who would your first guest be? They can be dead or alive. Uh, if I had my own talk show, my, my first guest, that, that is a great question. I would probably invite... Um, at the risk of being controversial, the sitting president, no, no one in particular. I, I, I just, let's, let's start with a bang. All right. This is the last one here. If you had a time machine and you can go into the future or into the past, which way are you going and what year are you going to? Oh, that's a great question. If I had a time machine, I'm, I'm going forward. No, no sense lamenting the past. If, if, you know, I'm, I'm moving forward and, you know, let, you know, let's take it. Let's take it ahead fifteen years here and see what AI has done to all of our all of our industries. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That was great. So now we're going to get more into your personal details, a little bit about your background and what makes you tick. So you grew up in Peculiar, Missouri, right outside of Kansas City. Is that right? Yes, you've you've done some research. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. So so how did growing up in Peculiar kind of shape who you are today? Peculiar at that point was was barely a dot on on a map considered the first non suburb of Kansas City, the first small town outside of of Kansas City. And um, I I just have to say our sign when you drive into town says welcome to Peculiar where the odds are with you. Um, (laughs) There you go. My next question was, do you know the logo of Peculiar (laughs) and uh, or not the logo, the the slogan? slogan. The slogan, I sorry, not the slogan. slogan is still there. It's as catchy as it is. Um, <laughs> listen, I love 
growing up in the Midwest. I, I, you know, the older I've become, the further I've come from, from Kansas City and in peculiar, the more I've appreciated being a part of uh, really understanding rural Missouri, rural life in the U.S., um, the opportunity to come back to graduate and spend time in such iconic college towns has been wonderful. But it's, it's you know, really affected me because I, I think that Midwest, the Midwest mentality, my ability to roll with it at times and, and you know, just take everything in stride. But I, I've, you know, really come to appreciate my Midwest upbringing. Great. So you got your bachelor's from the University of Missouri in hotel management. How did you know that you wanted to get into hotels? Was there something that happened? Did you work into a hotel? How did you know that's what you wanted to do? Yeah, it's an age-old story. My father was was in hotels. He was in resorts, actually. And I, I used to be, I remember in college, I was a journalism student, by the way, in at the University of Missouri in semester one. I wanted to be a DJ. David, I, I sit right where you are there now. Um, so what, what could ever happen with DJs? That's, that's a foolproof industry, um, radio. So I was a broadcast journalism student and I visited um, my dad. He was, he was running a resort on the coast of Puerto Rico, beautiful resort. And some conversation about getting a degree in hospitality and working with him or doing something. I went back in semester two long. I was a hotel and restaurant major and thought, you know, if I can live in interesting places and work with interesting people throughout a career, then then that's about as good a rationale as I need. I love that. I love that. So now we'll get into your career a little bit. So when you graduated in Missouri, did you get into hotels right away or did you kind of do other things before you start doing that? I'm one of those rare hotel people that had a plan, stuck with it. And I, I, I wouldn't say that since then I've had a plan. I've, I've just kind of been shuffled about, but I spent a couple of years in restaurant supervisor in college as I, as I worked my way through a hotel curriculum. When I finished, I went to work for Hyatt, spent the better part of a year in their management training program, did this in Kansas city, and then spent another year as an assistant front desk manager at a 750 room Hyatt. And then I got a call from a company that had just acquired a resort off the coast of Hilton Head Island on Defusky Island. And they were looking to renovate and reopen and they needed a night manager. And so I, you know, packed my bags and in the middle of January in Kansas City and headed to the South Carolina coast. Since then, as I've said, been shuffled around. I love that. And and you've been more focused on the operations side of things. You're the director of operations, and I might not say this correctly, but Casa Casarina, which was formerly the, the Versace mansion. And then you were the VP of operations at Bunkhouse, EVP of operations at The Standard. What really made you attracted to the operations side of things? I don't know that the, that just kind of happened naturally. I mean, I, I went into operations. My, my roles continued to to evolve in operations. I, I, I will tell you, I was in Austin. Um, I, you know, the same company that brought me to South Carolina owned a resort called Barton Creek, just outside of Austin, the hills outside of Austin. And I, I was the hotel manager there for six years. And it, it, during that time thought, what in the world am I going to do with my career? I don't know that I want to keep doing this. Um, I was, you know, what, what's, what's next? And it, it, as simple as that. I, I then, discovered a, a little hotel in Austin called the Hotel San Jose that Liz Lambert had, had opened, fell in love with it, reached out to her, started a relationship. And, you know, through that over the next couple of years, ended up having the opportunity to jump into, um, to jump into, into the creation of, of Bunkhouse and focus on these little experiential hotels that, you know, Bunkhouse is known for. And, had an absolute blast and discovered that that is a path that excites me, you know, creating something that surprises people, creating, putting stories in place that people discover when they travel. And I didn't feel like I was doing that as much early on. And it was perplexing to me as I, as I grew. And through that, I just, to your question, you know, continued to be the person that could kind of navigate the crossroads between vision and storytelling and how to operationally execute and throughout my career, how to do that at certain levels of scale. And so it it was always operations for me. So when you became president of 60 hotels, what was the biggest change for you moving from the operations side to to being president? Yeah, you know, 60 
w- was a, a pretty natural switch for me. But I would I had been over the operations at Standard Hotels. We had projects in the same markets: Miami, New York, LA, a few in New York, and and at that point planning for our London expansion. And I, I got the call from Jason Pomeranz. They were looking to find somebody to head up the collection of hotels that they had extracted from at that point. You, you remember the Thompson, the, you know, all, all of that. They had extracted their own assets, owned assets from that. And we're looking for somebody to, to oversee what would then be, you know, a new platform called 60. And it was pretty similar at that point, gave me the opportunity to jump into something that I, I considered at that point, pretty white label. We can do anything we want with this. We, you know, we can, we can define our, our path here. And I think, I think, Similarly, in that case, you know, I, I had had experience working with founders, work, working at a, at a smaller, almost startup platform um, that allowed us to do unique things, that allowed us to brainstorm. And, you know, yes, we were chasing what growth would be and looking for, for what was next, but had a lot of fun doing that. The biggest change, I, I think, would be really getting creative in how I put a team together, what initiatives I'd like to see executed, implemented into a brand to drive a multitude of things. In that case, you know, building uniqueness in the guest experience, driving team loyalty, how we can create a foundation that, that we build on as we grow into new markets. Those were the biggest differences than, than, than purely focusing on the operation side. Yeah, that was a cool group. I actually, when I was living in New York, I actually had an apartment at Thompson and Houston, right above a Toro's. And I remember right we were pitching Thompson. Yeah, we were pitching Thompson. And it was the clo- closest meeting I ever had in my life to where I lived. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. Great neighborhood. That was amazing. Yeah. So from 17 to 21, you were COO at Innsmore, a lifestyle company in London. What was different about not only being in Europe, but also the restaurant side versus just the hotel side? Well, I I mean, on the operation side, we always had the restaurants, right? Either in-house, in every case, there's there's third-party partners we've worked with, kind of a hybrid of, of all of it. Moving to to London and you know taking on the role in in Ennismore specifically with Hoxton, there were some independent restaurants, some, some other projects that you know at that point we're we're part of the Ennismore scope, but really focusing on the global growth of Hoxton, opening in the U.S., opening in in Europe, more throughout Europe, and a really fundamental understanding of what drives food and beverage. These are packed lobbies, but Hoxton had created, continues to create this amazing public space experience, kind of democratizes the public space as opposed to maybe some earlier brands that you know, created the exclusivity of the public space. This is everybody feels welcome and food and beverage as a result has always been very vibrant. So for me, really focusing on guest experience, what drives through a public space experience driven primarily, if not entirely by food and mev- beverage has been the focus. And you know, it's, you know, sure, you, you've got a, a, a really specific sense of costs and what drives success financially, but more, how do you focus on volume? How do you, how do you drive revenue when you've got the built-in, the built-in market? And, and by the way, I'd say at that point, early, early on, you know, Soho House was a partner of Venice More Hoxton. You know, Soho House was doing the food and beverage we had the opportunity when I came in as we, you know, Paris had just opened, the U.S. was opening, we'd been working so close. We created and took over all of that food and beverage. And that was a huge opportunity to really focus on the fundamentals of, of building a food and beverage program. I love that. And, and then in 2021, uh, you came over to graduate to be president. What made you come over to graduate and, and what's, what are you, what's your role now? What are your main focuses as president? Yeah, I, in, in 2021, I, I had made it. My wife and I were still living in the UK. Very odd time for all of us, for sure. And, you know, it, it, emerging from this, this period, Ennismore had a, just a massive opportunity with, with a core at that point to, to form a new Ennismore, to, to, to become the umbrella of what's now 14 brands and everything they've done in London with, with the core, which is a Paris-based company. And, and I had the opportunity to take a step back and say, look, is, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, this is the right place in time for me. My wife had an opportunity to come back to the, the States. We, we wanted to be closer to family and just made a decision at that point that this is a good crossroads. This is a good opportunity 
to explore what it would take to get back and really do some soul searching on, on what a next opportunity would look like if, if I were to tackle one in the U.S. And, and I got the call from graduate, started to hear, I mean, hard not to have graduate on your radar in 2021. In 2019, we had 13 hotels. In 2021, we had 32 hotels. So, it, you know, it, it had grown exponentially, you know, from, from 19 to 21. Forget about the fact that there was a pandemic happening at the same time. It, it, it's, it's unbelievable. So I saw just a, a really massive and exciting opportunity. I talked to Ben Weprin, talked to the, the team here, just a huge opportunity to focus on the, the excitement post-pandemic of a brand and a collection of hotels that had never really been taken out for a test drive. You know, it, it was fun. Now, understanding that, you know, there, there, there's no doubt that consistency and process and the scale that had been that, that had been applied during COVID, you, you know, was going to be a priority. How, do, how are we consistent with our guest experience? How are we consistent with our expectations, our team initiatives, all that? So I just saw it as a huge, exciting opportunity. It has been, it's been, it, it's been something I've, I've really enjoyed doing because similar to what we've discussed, the opportunity to implement programs that drive loyalty. We now have 2,200 team members uh, throughout the U.S. and the U.K. The opportunity to really focus on a guest experience that's about direct storytelling. It's about the, the, the collegiate, the university stories in these markets and what drives graduates concept and in, in our ability to to continue to be we are all students company it is just a lot of focus on those types of things and certainly the, just as exciting the ability to to continue to ensure that as many people as possible now that we are at this scale here about graduate as colleges come back post pandemic as for instance last year 800,000 more people walked through the doors of a graduate than at any other point in our history so th this this was an exciting time of growth, and a lot of initiative certainly surrounds that. But th that was that was something I was very excited. So, since you've been president, do you have a, a like a proudest accomplishment um, since you've you've been at the head? And also, what's next for graduate? A few things that I'm particularly proud of that pop into mind. You know, as I mentioned, it, it was. It was clear we we had to to focus our 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 vision our initiatives over the last couple of years. We had to be disciplined and really started to focus on the three areas that I've referenced. What what will drive team loyalty? How do we get now that we have twenty two hundred team members? How do we how do we really drive home what it means to be a part of graduate hotel brands? This brand that has exploded has almost tripled in size. How do we focus on initiatives that really solidify the guest experience? Our storytelling to a guest, the, how the design shines through. What, what does that mean and how are we consistent there? And certainly, as I mentioned, how do we continue to be innovative in our, in our brand story, in, in our ability to introduce this to people? You know, that if the mission is anybody in a household talking about college should know what a graduate hotel is. So some of the things I'm particularly proud of, um, we launched last year, David, a, a, a program called Graduate Academy. And Graduate Academy, I believe, especially at our size, is a best in class, is a best in class offering to our team members that you know allows them to pursue higher education. They can pursue their undergraduate degrees. We will pay for it. You know, when I got here, I thought it was important that we put our money where our mouth is in terms of education, in terms of you know, certainly the support in the universities that that that, that we work closely with. How do we do the same thing for our team members? How do we ensure that there are opportunities to develop? both with us and certainly develop in ways personally for our team members while they're with us. And I wanted to challenge the team to go back and, and find some ways to do that. So Graduate Academy allows us to pay for undergraduate education for any of our employees. It allows us to pay for high school education for any of our employees or their families. The same program includes English classes for any of our employees and their families. It includes any one of thousands of university certifications if they want to go get certified in something not related to even their role with us, we'll pay for that. So we've got people working in, in human resources that are, or sorry, in housekeeping that are pursuing their human resources certifications. We've got if people in our finance teams that are getting their CPA certifications. I've, we've got people on our engineering teams that are getting certified in different trades in order to grow their careers with us, to, to become more skilled and grow their careers with us. 
really happy about Graduate Academy and in what we've seen so far in a very short time in terms of retention, in terms of the offering as a benefit that people appreciate with us. Very proud about that. Similarly, we launched last year a program that allows all of our general managers to access you know, a, a global network of executive coaches. Right? We, I wanted to provide a way for general managers to find advocacy outside of, outside of graduate. We partnered with a company that has done a brilliant job in connecting them with these executive coaches so that, so that they had that and, you know, excited to continue to build on, to build on that program as well. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, second part of your question, what's next? We are actively working on getting Princeton open. Graduate today is 33 hotels. Palo Alto was the one we opened in January and it continues to grow and grow and grow. Very excited about that project, but now we're focused on uh, the next few. So the first two thirds of Princeton will open in, in March. We've got a new edition that will open and by graduation of next year, we'll have, we'll have that project open. That's 180 rooms right in the heart of Princeton that will double the amount of inventory in Princeton, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, that makes so, sense. <laughs> we're very excited about that project. We will then, we, we have a great hotel. It's called the Lumen, just across the street from, from SMU in, in Dallas. And we will be renovating that project over the course of next year. We won't shut it down, but it will be a graduate by the end of next year. And lastly, probably in Q3 of next year, we hope to open a big project in Auburn the graduate Auburn that will be opening hopefully, hopefully by, by fall. And that's a ground up project that we're pretty excited about. And, you know, the other one that we've announced at this point is, is the um, graduate Austin, which will open hopefully by the end of 2025. Awesome. Exciting things happening. So uh, now we're going to get to the point where we kind of talk to you about industry trends and your thoughts on what's going on in the industry. So one thing that you mentioned earlier is you got into hotels because you wanted to live in different places and work with unique people. What advice would you give to folks that are either thinking about getting into hospitality or maybe just got into the industry? That's a great question because, uh, you know, I'm not sure we're seeing as much flexibility. People, people aren't getting into this industry with as much flexibility of moving around like I, I used to think you had to in order to do it. But the, my first bit of advice was if, if you're serious about an exciting career in hospitality, there's got to be some flexibility in where you live and, you know, in, in, in what you're willing to take on. I've taken it, I've done that. I have, you know, and I, I feel as if I've benefited from that, but I think it's important. The other, you know, thing is, you know, in, in this business, stick with it. This is how many industries can you, can you boast that y- y- you can be a dishwasher or a, a bellman and, and end up running a hotel or, or a company. This is an industry of disproportionate reward if you stick with it as a career. And I firmly believe that. I, I also believe, and I've said this before, that we do a horrible job as an industry getting people excited about careers in this industry. How many industries made you know, news, continue to make news consistently, about how hard it is to find people to work in their industry. So we have to change the way we get people excited. I, I, leadership has to change the time, the, the attention, and the, the amount of, of focus on creative recruiting, and especially companies my size competing with, with larger companies. We have to do, we have to be innovative if, if we're going to win. So for people you know, looking to get into this business, looking to, to grow their careers, certainly people in leadership roles, continuing to be innovative, continuing to focus on keeping teams engaged in growing. We've got, you know, turnover with our leadership, general managers alone. We, we've had to go back to the drawing board on how we develop people internally, on how we focus on growth and how, how we work to create longevity with, with us. So I would tell them just to, to stick with it, be flexible and, and really focus on, on teams and innovation. Yeah, so you stole our, our our next question. You led right into it. I'll mix it up then. So we know that there's a staffing issue. We know that there's an issue with attracting talent in the hospitality. You're absolutely right. I mean, my first job was I was a, a bus boy at a Hyatt and a union bus boy. And when I took that job, never did I think I would be <laughs> stay with hotels and, and, and get into tech. But what else do you think is challenging the industry besides staffing? There's a lot that, you know, because I think our role is often to criticize some of the things that we want to improve in this industry. Um, I think we're a very slow industry 
to react from a technology standpoint. I, I you know, I, I mean, in fact, I, w- I would overemphasize, just like I said with labor, I think we are awful to adapt in, in, in terms of technology. And a lot of that has to do with legacy systems, different owners spending on technology, and, and certainly continuing to align on whether it's a priority. But we, we need to focus on different ways of meeting guests where they're at with technology. And I don't think we've done that yet. I was asked this question, uh, Steve, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, I, I believe that, you know, one of the ways we can continue to innovate is through our storytelling graduate, for sure, continuing to tell our stories. But, you know, we were featured, you know, as, as a company that has deliberately stayed analog recently. And so I would love to innovate in technology if it makes the guest experience with us better. And so far, you just continue to see a lot of spend on clunky systems that become outdated. And then you Key, keyless entry is an example. I've yet to find a, key, a, a keyless entry system that, that's worth investing in you know, be, because of its you know, application. So I, I think technology is an area we're very slow. Certainly, I mentioned labor. I'd love to see us as an industry continuing to focus on getting people excited in the experience. I think it's, it's easy to get away from that as it becomes more mechanical, as we're all focused heavily on financial results, you know, how are we motivating people to surprise our guests? How are we motivating and getting people excited to tell the stories that make us special? And that, and that's where, you know, I'd love to continue to focus both at graduate and in the industry. It's, it's necessary. I think you got a hold of our questions before we actually did this podcast because you knocked out the next two with that one question. I had a quote from you from ILC about technology, so that one's gone. But I do want to t- talk to you more about storytelling because you have worked with some really cool hotel groups. I mean, you've worked with the standard bunkhouse that do great jobs of storytelling. And now the graduate. I mean, that's an experience in itself, self staying there. Can you tell like what? storytelling play what role storytelling plays into hotels and also maybe an experience that you've had that's just been awesome that you know kind of had a storytelling experience yeah i listen, I, I think it's there's two things I, I getting team members excited about their journey with us gets me very excited in seeing a guest discover something that we have worked so hard you know up until that moment to ensure they discover is is something that gets me real excited. Bunkhouse standard, great with storytelling, great with thematic consistency, experience, but subtle, nuanced. It's it, it's about the environment. Graduate is about storytelling. We are about magnifying. We are about shouting about the the stories of of these universes. What makes the history so special? What makes these the heroes from these different towns, the team pride, the, you know, certainly the competition. We've got this very unique relationship with university in the U.S. in that we've got 50 countries competing against each other every Saturday for bragging rights. We've got so much, so many storytelling. When you, you think about the reasons people are visiting us, you know, a parent to visit their kids at school, uh, you know, their alma mater, dropping their their children off for the first time at, at college or you know, coming to root their alma mater on in a big football game. It's, it's huge, the amount of emotion. And if we can introduce, you know, different components very directly, very on the nose, we, we get to be very direct with a graduate with the stories we tell about why these markets are special, not just the universities, but the towns they're in and the, the, the legends that have evolved over time. I think that's pretty special. And I think that's, you know, something graduate has tapped into, especially in these markets that, you know, very few have been able to do and, and very few could keep up with. It's been a great part of this experience. For me, I mentioned a couple. I, there, there's so many times over the last year and a half where I've been blown away by the stories. I was just in Seattle last week and above the bed, there's a picture of these rowers from the 1930s. These, there's a movie coming out on Christmas, a George Clooney directed movie, I think called The Boys in the Boat. And it's about the rowing team from the Olympics in the 30s in Germany and Berlin. And how this team, this completely underrated team, became the best and you know huge pride for the University of Washington, competing against these Ivy Leagues globally and then going to the Olympics. I would not know about that story had it not been for the picture above our beds in every guest room, the lamps that are custom made. I, I referenced in Cincinnati, we've got a restaurant called Fiona's, which is about a hippopotamus at the Cincinnati Zoo, which sits immediately next to us. 
the whole world was captivated by this, this premature hippopotamus that they couldn't save. A really well-known children's hospital also sits directly next to us. The children's doctors were the ones that figured out how to save the hippopotamus. And today people come from all over the world to visit Fiona. And I'm learning this as I'm sitting at the, in the lobby bar at our hotel for the first time, you know, texting my wife who's bawling, you know, about this little hippo that wasn't supposed to survive called Fiona. But the stories that I learned, you, you walk into the hotel and there's a, a, a mural of action figures because the person that created the Star Wars action figures was from since the company was in Cincinnati when Star Wars came out and they, they got the rights to distribute them. We're walking into our lobby in Bloomington, Indiana, and the, the bleachers, the, the half of the lobby is bleachers that pull out from the wall. Like if you're in a basketball court, welcome to Indiana basketball. Or learning about the alumni when you, when you walk into any of our hotels and seeing, see pictures of the different people. We've got lamps in every guest room that are custom made for that property that, that also tell the story. So Bruce Lee is our lamp in Seattle, right? you know, or, you know, walk into um, our new hotel in Palo Alto and see the different types of, of alumni time capsules that each class does, you know, learning about the traditions, learning about what we're doing here in Nashville. We've got just as much of a, a story that weaves through this property about the rise of a young woman's country career as she she works her way up from sleeping on couches and playing dives to our rooftop called White Limousine. But just as much, we've got a tribute to to Vanderbilt throughout. The, we've got 180 watercolors about all the bushes and trees you'll find on the Vanderbilt campus. We've got, this is a funny one, drawer pools with squirrels on them in the rooms, on the dressers in the rooms, because there is a three to one ratio of squirrels to students on the Vanderbilt campus. So you name it, I, you know, it goes on and on and on the details we work through graduate hotels and the storytelling we do, but it's, it's, these are exciting, you know, exciting nods to, to the campus and, and some very big overt nods to the heroes that make these, these communities amazing. Yeah, that's great. So those, those stories, I, I believe lead into this question. So when I started, I finished school, I started working in New York and it was predominantly independent hotels. And I very quickly knew that I wanted to be a guy who worked in independent hotels because I didn't want to have to follow the brand's path or a management company's path per se. And and what we've seen over the years now is a lot of these really cool independent brands have been sold or independents have been sold to brands. So do you think that's you know, has been a goal of some of these brands or that's just kind of a, the natural evolution as you get big enough and financially makes sense that, you know, when you look at a core Hoxton, like we're we just going to keep seeing that as these independent brands grow and do a great job that they're just going to get gobbled up. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly won't say anything definitively, but I think the short answer is probably there's economic pressures as, as you grow. I think w what I love about small independent experiential platforms is our ability to be creative, our ability to become discovered. You know, certainly the media contributes to all that. We, we so many fun projects that I've been a part of in, in, in my career that people just fall in love with at some point in scale. You know, th there is a much bigger and broader way to introduce your brand to the masses. And, and, and often that's, you know, has to do with whatever generation of financial construct you're in. And so I, I think it's it's natural to think that if you can find a big brand to live within, you you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, selfishly, I, I, I love the independence. And, it, you know, I, I've worked with some companies that I, I think still remain fiercely independent. And even Ennismore is an attempt at remaining fiercely independent with the support of a, a, a kind of an arm's length bigger brand. You know, and I realize fully saying this, we're probably the largest portfolio of independent experiential hotels out there at this point. And, you know, there's there's a lot of pride in that. So I, I think, David, the answer to your question is probably, you know, a little bit of both. We, we'll continue to see people innovate. We'll continue to see people, you know, look to find new ways. And I think the Internet has allowed us a more level playing field. And I think access to design has allowed us a more level playing field. But as things continue to evolve in the macroeconomic climate, I think we'll also continue to see brands look to look to some of the some of the big brands for for support and for wider distribution. Well, that was great, Kevin. So our producer John has been sitting by listening here. So we're going to kick it off to him for the final question here. 
All right. So at the very beginning, you said your favorite vacation spot was Italy. You said full stop. So I'm curious what about Italy makes that answer so easy for you? And then two-parter, what from those experiences from Italy do you, um, how does that impact your personal hospitality philosophy and what you bring to your work at Graduate? My wife and I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time in Italy. Her family is from Puglia. When we lived in England, we, we would spend a lot of time in, in, in Puglia. We had an opportunity of, in 21 to spend a month in Northern Italy in the mountains and along the way, you know, just different locations w- w- without exception. I have, aside from how beautiful Italy is, how good the wine is and how much I like the food, the natural hospitality that you experience without exception throughout Italy is, is mind blowing to me. I, I think it's a lesson we can all learn. It's, it is a cultural thing, it, you know, but the, the willingness to share the excitement about getting people down there. Not all countries are like that. You know, it's not always, please come. I've always felt familial amongst the chaos in Italy. I, I, I love it. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the level of hospitality and how welcome, no matter how busy they are, how welcome you always feel in, in, in Italy. And that's, that's what, what drives that answer. Certainly it's a beautiful place to be for me. You know, I, mentioned earlier, I get really excited when people discover an experience. I get really proud of people. I get really proud when it clicks, when people walk in and they discover this is what graduate is. This, this is what they have set out to accomplish. And for me, that's a host, you know, same thing. If, if the lights and the aroma and the music and the design and the team that's proudly standing there providing what we've worked so hard to do, when it all comes together, I get I, I, nothing gets me more excited. And, you know, and I, I think we could all learn a lesson, especially, you, you know, as we struggle with, you know, teams and labor and in all of these things on the level of hospitality that just seems to be extremely, come extremely natural in Italy. And I, I've always loved that. Well, that does it for another episode of the Modern Hotelier. This is where, Kevin, we'd like you to let people know how they can find graduate, how they can get in touch with you. Plug away. Sure. Feel free to reach out to, to me directly. I be our graduatehotels.com. It's on there. And, you know, feel free to track me down. Very excited to have talked to you and appreciate the time today. This was fun. Thank you. Well, that does it for another episode of The Modern Hotel. You Thank you for joining in and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Welcome to today's episode. We're thrilled to introduce you to Stay Flexi, an innovative platform revolutionizing the hospitality industry. Backed by Y Combinator, StayFlexi is a modern, all-in-one PMS platform. Leveraging the power of AI, it's transforming how hotels operate, maximizing efficiency, and boosting sales for unsold rooms. Already, over 2,000 properties worldwide have made the switch to StayFlexi, experiencing the difference it makes. And here's the best part. Exclusively for our listeners, StayFlexi is offering an incredible lifetime deal at just $149 per month. That's an astounding 80% discount. Don't miss this opportunity to elevate your hotel's performance with Stay Flexi. Stay tuned for more details. You made it to the end of The Modern Hotelier. Thanks for listening. The Modern Hotelier is produced by Make More Media. Make sure to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or follow wherever you get your podcasts. If you know of a guest or sponsor that would be a good fit, feel free to email us at hello at themodernhotelier.com. Thanks and have a great day.